guests, my friends, is Talk Today with me, Jeremy Kyle. And me, Nicola Thorpe. For the news that matters, for the opinions that matter, for the stories that matter, find me, Vanessa Phelps, every weekday at 4 p.m., only on Talk, on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. And good afternoon, I'm Ian Collins, you're with Talk on TV, radio, online and of course on your smart speaker. Busy afternoon, Rishi Sunak says comments made by suspended MP Lee Anderson in which he said Islamists had got control of the London mayor, said he can't, were wrong and unacceptable as both parties battle elements of dog whistle politics. Are we set for the most inflammatory election in political history? We'll look at that next. Also, people in their early 20s are more likely to not be working due to ill health than those in their early 40s, a report has found. Just what is behind Sick Note Britain? We'll look at that story too. And Mary Poppins, go blimey, gov, is no longer the family classic as its age rating is raised to PG because it contains discriminatory language. A sing-along to a spoon for the sugar will soon land you 10 years in the slammer, it seems. And of course, it's your call. This show is all about your responses and your opinions. We're asking this question, was Rishi right to suspend Lee Anderson? Lines are open, 0344 499 1000. You can text 87222 or on the socials, it's at Talk TV. But first, let's get the latest news headlines with Divya. Good afternoon. Lee Anderson has refused to say sorry for comments that sparked an Islamophobia row, saying, when you think you're right, you should never apologise. The Tory MP for Ashfield made a statement earlier today after he was suspended by the party for claiming London Mayor Sadiq Khan was being controlled by Islamists. Rishi Sunak refused to call the MP's comments Islamophobic when asked earlier. Well, I think the, the most important thing is that the words were wrong. They were ill-judged. They were unacceptable. And that's what I believe. And that's why the whip has been suspended. And I think, I think everyone can see that tensions are already running high. And what I want to do, I think what the country wants to see, is the heat taken out of this debate. And I think that's the right thing to do. A U.S. Air Force serviceman who set himself on fire in front of the Israeli embassy in Washington, D.C. has died. Emergency services were called to extinguish 25-year-old Aaron Bushnell at around 6 o'clock yesterday evening in what is being reported as a pro-Palestinian protest. Hundreds of protesting farmers are causing huge disruption in Brussels today as they call on the European Union to do more to protect their industry. Tractors have blocked off the road outside the main headquarters, dumped tyres on the road and set them on fire. Riot police are currently trying to deal with the disorder sparked by anger over red tape and cheap imports. French farmer Morgan Odi says the EU is undercutting them. We are here again in Brussels today as farmers because the European Union is not listening to our demands. Our demand is for fair revenue. We don't make a living out of our work. We produce the food and we don't make a living. Why is so? Because of free trade agreements, because of deregulation, because the prices are below cost of production. The boss of Ryanair says the price of flights across Europe will rise this summer because of a lack of planes. Chief Executive Michael O'Leary is warning customers to expect fare increases of up to 10%. He says it's down to the plane maker Boeing struggling to make deliveries on time. A Norwegian cruise ship's been blocked from docking in Mauritius over fears of a potential cholera outbreak on board. Samples have been taken from people on the Norwegian Dawn after passengers reported feeling unwell. Officials confirmed there are more than 2,000 passengers and 1,000 crew on the ship. And to Everton Football Club's 10-point deduction has been reduced to six points after a review by an independent board. The Premier League club was found to have breached profitability and sustainability rules last season. The slight bump raises the club five points clear of the relegation zone. That's the latest weather time now with Nazneen Gaffer. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello. So far today, most places have started off fine and dry for the new week, except down towards parts of the southeast. You can see in the earlier satellite and radar picture, 
there was a lot of rain and very strong winds. Now, the rain's mostly cleared away for this afternoon from parts of the southeast, but the winds remain strong there. Therefore, it's going to be feeling rather cold. Winds are lighter elsewhere, particularly further north and west, and there's lots of sunshine to be had. Just the odd passing shower or two, perhaps, for the northeast of England. It's still feeling cold, much like the weekend. Temperatures are around average for the time of year. They're up to around 8 degrees Celsius. Now, overnight, the winds will eventually ease across parts of the southeast, and with all the moisture in the air, this is likely to cause some areas of mist, fog and freezing fog around eastern and southeastern parts of England. Meanwhile, across the northwest, it becomes cloudier, wetter and windier for Scotland, Northern Ireland and perhaps the far northwest of England. And through tomorrow, that rain will continue to steadily move its way further south and eastwards down towards northern and western parts of England and Wales. For parts of eastern England, it will be a murky start to the day. Visibility may be poor, but around mid-morning, uh, mid we will see the skies clear there. And it will brighten up for Scotland and Northern Ireland with lots of sunshine, but also plenty of showers. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. And good afternoon. So the Prime Minister Rishi Sunak has rejected claims of anti-Muslim racism in the Conservative Party. Speaking in the last hour, Rishi Sunak once again condemned the words of former party chairman and Tory grassroots hardman Lee Anderson. The most important thing is that the words were wrong. They were ill-judged, they were unacceptable, and that's what I believe, and that's why the whip has been suspended. And I think, I think everyone can see that tensions are already running high, and what I want to do, I think what the country wants to see, is the heat taken out of this debate, and I think that's the right thing to do. Well, you heard it there. He said the comments were ill-judged and wrong, but stop short of labelling them as racist. Let's have a quick reminder, then, of how Lee Anderson landed himself in hot water. He's, uh, he seems to be letting the, uh, not only the Jewish population down, but the old population of London and Britain as a whole. And I heard the comments here, I heard the comments earlier you was making about Suella, some of the comments she made earlier this week. And I don't actually believe that these Islamists have got control of our country, but what I do believe is they've got control of Khan and they've got control of London and they've got control of Storm as well. Well, here's the thing, though. It's Lee Anderson's refusal to say sorry that lost him the whip and got him suspended from the Conservative Party. Speaking over the weekend, Deputy Prime Minister Oliver Dowden said he had said had Anderson apologised, he could have stayed within the party. Maybe Lee, though, just isn't that bothered. Sunak made Anderson deputy chair, of course, because of his popularity among voters who backed the Tories for the first time in 2019. And MPs from the North and the Midlands over the weekend said that many of their constituents were unhappy about Anderson's suspension. Now, the Prime Minister has been warned to expect a backlash from Red Wall Tories over Lee's removal from the party. Tory MPs, already a little nervous about their chances at the up-and-coming election, have received a deluge of messages in support of Lee. Jill Mortimer, the MP for Hartlepool, posted messages from her constituents in a Tory WhatsApp group saying they would never vote Tory again and that Lee Anderson's suspension is the final nail in the party's coffee. But the issue of, Islam of Islamophobia is not limited to Mr Anderson. His comments were in response to an article in The Telegraph by the former Home Secretary Suella Bravman. Bravman had claimed, of course, Islamists are in charge of Britain now. Yet she remains a member of the Conservative Party, for a while at least. Former Prime Minister Liz Truss is on her tinfoil hat tour of America. Truss failed to challenge the right-wing agitator Steve Bannon when he called convicted criminal and anti-Islam campaigner Tommy Robinson a hero. Britain's largest Muslim group has now written to the Conservative Party to call for an investigation into what they call structural Islamophobia within the party ranks. The Muslim Council of Britain said Islamophobia in the party was institutional, tolerated by the leadership and seen as acceptable by great swathes of party membership. Back in 2019, during the leadership election, Sajid Javid called for an investigation into Islamophobia within the party too. All the other candidates agreed to it, including the eventual winner, Boris Johnson. Do you all agree, guys? Absolutely. Should we should we have an external investigation of the Conservative Party into Islamophobia? Absolutely. So they all agree. Rory, do you agree? Yes. Excellent. So, they agree. OK, that was so, easy. Well, Boris Johnson was famously accused of Islamophobia by the former Tory chair after he compared Muslim women in burqas to letterboxes and bank robbers. Comments that, to his credit, he subsequently apologised for. The report published in 2021 found anti-Muslim sentiment was a problem. 
So with all of this in mind, was Rishi right to suspend Lee Anderson? I really want to gauge your comments on this. Let's do a litmus test. What is the country thinking about this? Was Rishi right to suspend him, even if you agree with some of what he said? Did you agree with all of it? 0344 499 1000. Joining me live in the studio, political editor at the Daily Express, Sam Lister, is with us. It's interesting, Sam, we were talking just before we came on air. Um, last week, the Labour Party were embroiled in anti-Semitism. Um, it appeared the Tories were having a very rare moment of having the moral high ground. And then this happens. Yeah. I think that's it. It's a huge headache for Rishi Sunak. He thought he had the advantage last week because Labour was in such a state yeah. uh, with this ongoing issue of anti-Semitism. Keir Starmer, obviously, over the last few years, has made this big play about how he has rooted out the problem from the party. That clearly is not the case, as we've seen over recent weeks. But just as, it, as it's come back to kind of bite him on the bottom, we've seen the same with the Prime Minister in that, uh, the, obviously, there has been the, the claims over years of Islamophobia in the Conservative Party. And obviously, with uh, the comments made by Lee Anderson, it allows critics to come in and make those accusations again. In terms of where this goes next, then, because Anderson has doubled down. He said, I'm not going to apologise. But, I mean, his comments were... E even if you love Lee Anderson, even if you understand that there, or, or believe there's a kind of culture clash going on in this country, you see the scenes on Saturday night on Tower Bridge and some of the protests we've seen, people waving ISIS flags and with all sorts of horrible things written on placards. Even if you agree with all of that, the central point that Anderson made was essentially that Sadiq Khan is, is kowtowing and backed up by Islamists. So, not Muslims, Islamists. So, this is a, quite a big accusation. I mean, that's demonstrably not true. Yeah. And, and that's the problem he's got, isn't it? He could have said so much more around this and made a very powerful point. Yeah, and I think, clearly, he, Lee himself today has issued a statement, he's made a statement where he says his language was cl clumsy. So, you know, he hasn't apologised. He's been very clear that he doesn't want to apologise because he actually believes there is an issue... Uh, to be addressed, yeah. but he has admitted that that phrasing was clumsy. I think that's probably as far as he will go on that. But clearly, the Prime Minister, the Deputy Prime Minister and various other members of the Cabinet have said that words were wrong and that they should not have been mm. used. Um, so you've got a bit of an impasse at the moment. But I think longer term, Lee loves the party and the party love Lee. So I think it would be unlikely that this goes on forever. I think a way will be found to bring him back yeah. into the party. I think that's... Deep down, I would imagine that is what he wants. He He's a man who, let's not forget, over the last year, has spent every weekend touring the country, talking to constituency associations. The membership love him. He's got deep friendships within the party in yeah. Parliament. So I think a way will be found to bring him back into the fold at some point. Yeah, and he's a former Labour man, of course. So, you know, he knows what it's like on the other side. Realised he didn't <laughs> like it very much and went to what he thought was the logical position. I, I guess, you know, that is the problem. The... That, that the spirit of what he said will resonate with a lot of people, even if the actuality is not quite true. So, yes, you could say Sadiq Khan has been hopeless on those protests. Mm. He runs the police. He's essentially the crime commissioner, if mm. you like, for London. He's in charge. He could do a lot more. He's tolerating things that shouldn't be tolerated. He could have said all of that, but he put it in a, as he said, a clumsy way. But no apology so far, but you sense there'll be a way through. Because the, the allegation or the suggestion is that he'll just join reform. I think that, I mean, clearly, Lee Anderson and Reform have long had this kind of flirtation, let's put it that way. Yep. But I don't think really that's what either side want. I think for Lee, he firmly is well established within the Conservative Party. I think for Reform, they've got other things to think about, like who do they actually want to be the figurehead for that party? Is it Lee Anderson? Uh, I don't think that's probably what everybody in the party wants. Um, and so I don't think that's the likely outcome of this. I think genuinely it really is a ret return to the Conservative Party in some form, I would imagine. I'm not, I'm not saying this based on any uh, actual uh, nod or, or wink yeah. from anybody in number 10 or anything like that, but I think for me that is the logical conclusion here. But I think the issues that Lee raises, they do resonate because people are... Um, many people are fed up with the protests, actually. They're fed up of seeing um, the things like we saw with Parliament with uh, the projection onto Big Ben yeah, yeah. last week. 
Um, they're fed up with the cost to policing. We will have a story tomorrow which talks about the impact on mm. policing that these constant protests are having. And actually, so there is a there is an issue to be addressed, but obviously it's not the issue that Lee raised and yeah. it's not the the wording he used either. There it is. Um, let's move on to this story. Spare a thought for those in their early 20s. They're more likely to be off work due to ill health than those in their early 40s. Um, much of this comes down to mental health issues uh, as distinct from people who've got a wonky arm or a dodgy leg. <laughs> Um, now, of course, you are forced to have that sort of slightly uncomfortable debate because nobody wants to undermine the seriousness of mental health issues, etc. It's akin to second-degree murder <laughs> to do that these days. But there are genuine issues that previously were undiagnosed yeah. and now we can talk about that stuff. But simultaneously, that in itself brings a problem that yeah. anyone who's having a bit of a bad day or feeling that they're in a period of not, you know, not ticking along so, so well yeah. um, will call it a mental health issue. Now, that's, there's a wide difference between you know, being on a downer mm. and having bipolar or suffering from some other form of depression, because that's largely what this is about. Or is it just that 20-year-olds don't want to go to work? <laughs> well, I think, essentially, the, from what I can work out, the only people at work are people in their 30s and 40s, because we know the 50s, they didn't return to work after the pandemic. True. Apparently, they're all on the golf course, according to some reports you read. And then the uh, people in their 20s are all um, sat at home feeling sad. And it, it seems like the, the backbone of this country at the moment is the 30s and 40s. I think so it's us in our early 30s keeping absolutely it Absolutely, early sad. 30s. Thank you, Ian. Yeah, yeah, and, uh, not a problem. <laughs> but I think, you know, it, it's difficult... To be fair to people in their 20s, they have much more to put up with in terms of social media and the, the impact that has, yeah. the fact that they can't get on the housing ladder, all these kind of things. Um, but actually also, I think probably people our age and older do question the resilience of younger people, that even if you are feeling particularly down, you can still go into work and, and they want to see people mm. um, find ways to, to carry on being productive in the workplace while coping with these issues. And there are ways to do that. You can have various therapies or medical assistance. It doesn't mean you have to be at home. I think for the government, they are trying to tackle this. They have got a, a back to work programme. I think it's called work, uh, Wellness to Work or something similar. Um, and that is about helping people with mental health problems return to the workplace or get into the workplace yeah. for the first time. But obviously that's a long, slow process. And I think the big issue is w once you've been out of work for a while, it's very hard to go back. True. Long-term unemployment, once you hit kind of 18 months, two years, yeah. it's very hard for you to ever get back into so you're work. So you're kind of in a rut. But I wonder whether we've recalibrated, or some people have recalibrated expectations of what the, the kind of job that they see as acceptable. Friday night, went out, uh, went to a, a little thing at my little boy's school, and after my half said, oh, let's go to Wagamama's. Mm. On, there's one on the high street. We're nipping there, it's pretty quick, food's a bit tasty, um, it'll be fine. Get to the door, saw a little bit of a queue there, but I looked through, I realised it was half full, so I thought that it's going to be fine. Mm. Uh, the girl comes up to us, who was about 18, and she said, really sorry, it's about an hour and 10 minutes wait. Wow. I said, well, look, it's, it's half full. She said, we haven't got any staff. Right. She said, we literally have no staff. She was very honest, very decent, mm. very polite. They couldn't get people to work there. We nipped next door to Pizza Express. We did get a table, but they were clearly having similar problems. Yeah. You could just tell. And all those areas of hospitality, I mean, if you're an 18, 19, 20-year-old, it not, might not be a full-time career, yeah. but a Friday night shift in Pizza Express or Wagamama's would have been standard fare, wouldn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that, that I mean, we, that, that just was the way I certainly grew up, was that you were expected to have a part-time job while you were studying. Yeah. There was no um, question that you wouldn't. So I think... You know, certainly I've been working since uh, since I was in my early teens. Um, and, and so I think that is a, a cultural thing, isn't it? Once people kind of get out of the habit of that. What I thought was interesting, actually, was um, over the weekend, there's a new biography about Keir Starmer that's just been published, looking into his backstory. And it has this quite interesting line about how his mother, uh, we know she suffered from a chronic illness throughout her life. And it mentioned that actually it's made him very intolerant of people who call in sick who or who have kind of milder illnesses and yeah. use it to not come into work. And I think that will be quite interesting to see how the Labour Party then tackles this kind of issue, because obviously for the Conservatives, it, it can be a perception of they're being yeah. cruel to people. But actually, Keir Starmer, I think, feels very personally that actually people should be in work, it's good for them. And that when you've seen real suffering, um, yeah. people who seem to be less so, uh, yeah, suffering true. less so, should be being productive in society. Uh, let's move on to this final story. Devastating news if you're a fan of Mary Poppins uh, because they've changed the rating. It was a U, 
Uh, it's now going to be an 18, not an 18, <laughs> a PG. X-rated. Yeah, uh, because apparently of discriminatory language and it's all down to the term Hottentots, which is uh, apparently used to be uh, a, a term historically used by Europeans to refer to a group of nomadic um, herders in South Africa, but it's now seen as racially offensive. That term appears two or three times, tw uh, twice, I think, in the film. Um, and because of that, they've upped it to a to a PG, which is kind of curious, because I don't imagine that the audience that could see a U, i.e., you know, three-year-olds, would be calling this one out. I mean, you, you kind of think some people don't have enough work to do, don't you, when, when you get this yeah. kind of reclassification? It seems, as you say, uh, completely pointless, really. I think the only way now to solve this issue is to um, to put a, uh, a categorisation on everything that was made before 2022, because clearly there will be something offensive in everything. Do you know what? I? It's interesting because when you watch, and I only saw this recently, and it did stop me in my tracks. I think it was Dumbo or something. Mm. And actually, Dumbo had been called out a long time ago right. for the crow scene, which was seen as a bit, you know, sort of racially stereotypical, a load of black crows sing, and it was all voiced by black actors. Right. I mean, some would say that's how it should be. You know, you, you, you've literally got black actors to play a black character. Yeah. Like, if it was swans, it might be white actor. I don't know. But some people have made yeah. that argument. But either way, um, I was surprised when the kids put on Dumbo to see a warning at the beginning that this film contains old stereotypes. <laughs> some people might find it offensive. But I think that's, that is the point, isn't the it? The fact that it's got a flying elephant in it, you know, was, was of <laughs> no relevance at all, yes. <laughs> I mean, essentially, everything is offensive to modern sensibilities. That was made in the 70s, 80s, yep. 90s, you know, even the early noughties, I think, uh, most, you know, yeah. even even the comedy Friends, the most anodyne uh, of all Indeed. comedies, is now offensive. So Absolutely. I think, you know, we should just yeah. accept that everything back in the day uh, will offend somebody nowadays and, uh, and move on with our lives. And the sad thing about the crow scene, just a final point, it's one of the best parts of the film. It's such a great scene, the singing crows, you know, when I see an elephant fly and all of that. It's iconic. So. I don't remember. I, <laughs> yeah, I'll send you the VHS. Excellent. Um, <laughs> listen, Sam, thank you. Good to see you. Sam, listen with us here on Talk TV. Coming up after the break, is the Conservative Party Islamophobic? We'll look more at that story. I'm Ian Collins. You're with Talk TV on TV, radio, online, and your smart speaker. Very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Oh, it's, bless him, he's soaking wet. Nice. The most likely situation is that that statue is going to end up in M Shed, which is a museum just on the harbour. Nick, I, when we first went to you, I thought you dived into the harbour to get the, get the thing out, for God's sake, man. Well done, good job. Islamism is sweeping our nation. This is not Islamophobia, this is real. Another terror attack, another killing of an MP. Oh, don't worry, let's light a candle, let's all sing, let's look, don't look back in anger and sing Kumbaya. He had a, a politically uh, minded project called WikiLeaks, which said yeah. nothing about what was going on in the Kremlin, nothing about what was going on in China. There was a clear political bias in what he was doing. This is the first time Millam has heard of asylum seekers coming to the town. If we are guinea pigs, then I think we should have been consulted. This concept that actually kids wouldn't carry knives if they could go and play tiddlywinks at the, you know, the corner of a street or whatever. I think it's a nonsense. Well, it will be a problem if they start breaking into people's homes because they can break into yours and decide that you're not doing enough. <laughs> they can break into mine and decide I'm not doing enough. And I tell you what, if they break into my home, it will get violent. That's for sure. It's not like, you know, they live in an average semi and where's Harry going to sleep? You might have thought he's come all the way. Couldn't he at least have spent a couple of days with them at Sandringham just, you know, to use the vernacular, chilling out a bit? <laughs> What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on. <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> Whoa, is it? There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> There are no banners calling for and the re release of the condemn, hostages. They will not there are no banners, mass. Kevin. You can't say everyone on that march not, when no, we can't no, say no, them on the march. Sorry, no, I'm yeah. sorry, I've got, I've got you both. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you no, can't. Like good. I'm, so, I'm sorry. Stop creating all of these funny little factions with their funny little names, the New Conservatives, the ERG, the Common Sense Research Group, the Red Wall, Red Trouser, Popcorn. I mean, Popcorn, what, what is that? What on earth 
is going on in the House of Commons? I'll try my very best to explain that, Daisy, but it is an extremely complicated situation. This just absolutely stinks. Right, Neil Parrish, he was great for his area. Rishi Sunak actually brought him out today and said, this guy's going to be advised You're by a special counsel. Right. If anybody can pull it off, it'll be him. Oh. <laughs> what? Oh. What? Oh. <laughs> My your mind. mind. <laughs> it's not our mind, it's your mouth, Mr. Unbelievable. Collins. Unbelievable. Yeah. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Uh, welcome back to the show. Man, it's going to be busy this afternoon. I'm Ian Collins. You're with Talk TV, on TV, radio, online, and, of course, your smart speaker. Now, following the suspension of Lee Anderson, Britain's largest Muslim group has written to the Conservative Party to call for an investigation into structural Islamophobia within the party ranks. Joining me live, Conservative MP and former Justice Secretary Robert Buckland. Good afternoon to you, sir. Hello, Ian. Nice to have you with us. Um, was Rishi Sunak right to suspend him? Yes, I think he was. I think, sadly, Lee crossed the line into uh, something that was clearly uh, anti-Muslim. If that had been, a, for example, a Jewish mayor uh, saying that he'd been instructed by Jewish friends, but I think we'd all easily say that that was anti-Semitic, there should be no hierarchy of hate. And I think Lee crossed the line and the Prime Minister was right. Do you think... I mean, he, he subsequently said, Robert, I, I think this afternoon or earlier this morning, uh, that his, his language was clumsy. He didn't apologise. He, he doesn't strike me as a man that apologises easy. He doesn't like a backtrack because he wants the mood music, I suppose, to, to, to hang. Um, but what was his point? What, what was he trying to say? Much but, in the same words as Suella mm -hmm. Bravman, which I'm sure you would also disagree with, but after what happened in Parliament last week, a, a very undignified scene and some suggesting that there were MPs that were... Uh, almost forced to change their minds because of an Islamist pressure on them. Yeah. Is that yeah, the point? Of the Which would have been fine if he, he'd have made that point, rightly or wrongly. It, it, he, he could have said it, that. Bang on, Ian. That's exactly my point. Uh, if you make, you know, mistakes like this in ill-informed comments, you detract from the wider argument that it is legitimate. There's something really quite worrying going on with elements of the far left and extreme Islamist elements coming together to put pressure on MPs and indeed through some of the elements we've seen in the protests really uh, show an ugly underbelly of extremism in this country that most right-thinking citizens are appalled by, me included. We need to talk that through, we need to confront it, we need to take action. Uh, and, and Lee's comments detracted from that. It's become now a row about who said what within the Conservative Party. That That's not where we need to be. Let's talk about, you know, wider society and how we deal with these challenges to our values, what we believe in in this country, the rule of law and our British values. That is where I think Conservatives should be. And that's where I think, you know, sensible people, including your viewers, would want us to focus. Yeah. And in terms of the wider question, does the Tory party have an Islamophobia problem? What's your response to that, Robert? Well, there was an inquiry a few years ago set yeah. up by the party just after the general election. It reported a couple of years back with a series of uh, recommendations that are being implemented. I think incidents like this put the onus on the party to make sure that it is following through on all those incidences. I know of examples where people have been indeed been suspended and expelled for comments that are anti-Muslim, and rightly so. Um, and we've just got to keep on demonstrating that we're prepared to take action uh, because the Conservative Party is at its best when it, once it confronts the issues and threats to our society, we bring the nation together and through leadership, you know, we we unify and we don't stoke division. And, and that's, I think, where we need to focus. So I don't think there's, you know, systemic Islamophobia. And I think the answer to that letter will be that we've already been, you know, honest and open about looking into this, uh, but that we've always got to root out examples where we find them and take action. In the spirit of forgiveness, then, Robert, would you feel comfortable if Lee Anderson was reinstated? Well, I think uh, Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position. But I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong, that he'd reflected, and that, indeed, he was uh, wrong in his comments about uh, the, the Mayor of London. There's a lot to criticise Sadiq Khan about, Ulez, 
failures on crime and law and order in the capital. Yeah. Uh, you know, loads that we can attack uh, Sadiq Khan on uh, and his weak record. He doesn't deserve to be re-elected. But uh, let's stick to the facts and not say things that just you know, come back to bite us. That, that's that been the problem with what happened uh, over the weekend. Indeed. Robert, thank you for your time. Really appreciate that. Robert Buckland, Conservative MP, thank former you. Justice Secretary with us here on Talk TV. Let me just read you a text that came through. I think this kind of sums up a lot of feeling that people have. We asked the question, was Rishi Sunak right to suspend Lee Anderson? Um, and this came in from... Leslie, who says, no, he was not right. Lee is, the one, Lee is one who loves his country and will fight for millions of voters. He is a superstar. Millions of people will feel exactly the same way as I do. He needs to be reinstated and Sadiq Khan needs to be sacked and removed immediately. What's interesting about that is that I get that feeling. I totally get that feeling. But the fact is, he said something that demonstrably wasn't true. Now, it might not have been first-degree murder territory, but you would argue that the Conservatives, who had the moral high ground over the Labour Party last week, with all the anti-Semitism stuff going on, have slightly lost that position, some might say. Let's speak to Mohammed Amin, former chairman of the Conservative Muslim Forum. Mohammed, good afternoon to you. Good afternoon, Ian. Nice to have you with us. Um, so, I mean, you're a Conservative, but you're a Conservative with a, with a question mark over the party. Would that be reasonable? Not quite. I was a member of the Conservative Party for 36 years, but I resigned from the party the day that Boris Johnson became the party leader. And I'm now a grassroots member of the Liberal Democrats. OK. That, some would say that's some kind of leap and the parties aren't as good. Well, when I was a tr uh, in my 20s, about the age of 20, I was a Trotskyist, so people changed their views. Well, every, everybody was one of those ones, weren't they? Sort of. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I mean, on this point of... Uh, Lee Anderson, let, I mean, let's start with, with his comments. What, what do you make of what he said about Sadiq Khan at the weekend? I was disgusted when I saw Lee Anderson's original comments. He was basically attacking Sadiq Khan fundamentally for being a Muslim. Because you, when you're talking about him being controlled by Islamists, when you're talking about his friends, implying that his friends are all Muslims... You would not be, he would not be saying those things about Sadiq Khan if Sadiq Khan was not a Muslim. And I think Anderson's comments were disgraceful, and it's quite right that he's been suspended. I don't think his explanation of those comments is in any way adequate. Mm. Uh, and as I've said consistently since uh, we, we came on air about uh, 30 minutes ago, Mohammed, if you... Uh, if you look at Sadiq Khan's cabinet, for example, you know, it's it's not full of Muslims. I mean, there's all manner of different people in deputy positions and transport positions. Love them or Absolutely. hate them. I mean, that, that, that's the reality of it. Do you think, though, what, what, what Lee Anderson was trying to get across was kind of a reflection of what happened in Parliament, that there are some Islamist voices that... Are, are punching above their weight. They're getting airtime. They're not getting condemnation. We've seen some of the pro-Palestinian protests where there have but whilst largely peaceful, I get all of that. There have been people with ISIS flags and saying horrendous things on megaphones, lighting up Parliament with from the river to the sea. Uh, what we saw in Parliament on the voting last week. So there's, there's a sense that there is an issue and the mayor of London, who's in charge of policing, has not dealt with it very well. I don't think he was really saying that. If he wanted to say that, he could have said it quite easily. Yeah. No MP should feel in danger of their personal security. Anybody who threatens MPs needs to have the law thrown at them. But the Mayor of London is the Police and Crime Commissioner. He does not have operational responsibility. We divide it very carefully because we don't want to politicise police. So the police make their own decisions about how they handle demonstrations. But he could be very vocal on it. As the Mayor of London, he could say, it is unacceptable to have this happening or that happening. We cannot have people lighting up Big Ben with one of the most well-known racist tropes out there, even if it is open to another interpretation. We know what those people were trying to do. He, he, could, he could have made a comment on that, and it's that kind of thing that has really irked a lot of people including well, Lee Anderson. Well, I haven't followed all the things that Sadiq Khan hasn't said, but if Lee Anderson wanted to say that he felt that Sadiq Khan could do a better job of speaking up 
on those aspects of the demonstration that he doesn't agree with, that Anderson doesn't agree with, then he should have said that. But that is not what he said. My complaint with Anderson is quite simple. It's what he actually said, not what he might have said. Do you think the Tory party has a problem, an Islamophobia problem? Well, we need to be very precise on this. I have never believed in my 36 years when I was a Conservative that the leadership of the Conservative Party was anti-Muslim. At the same time, when you look at the demographics of the makeup of the Conservative Party, its grassroots membership, and Professor Tim Bale at Queen Mary University of London has written quite a lot about Conservative Party members, YouGov have done surveys, and the surveys of Conservative Party grassroots members find disturbingly high levels of anti-Muslim prejudice and anti-Muslim uh, bigotry. That's just a fact. I mean, and it needs to be rooted out. I don't believe that the Conservative Party has done enough mm. from the top to actually root that out. OK, um, there is room for a wider debate here, and I'm sure, Mohammed, we will speak again. But thank you, sir, for your time, Mohammed Amin, who is the former chairman of the Conservative Muslim Forum with us here on Salt TV. Let's get some comment from you on this. Uh, we asked whether Rishi Sunak was right to have suspended Lee Anderson. Simon is in Winchester. What are you making of it, Simon? Good afternoon to you. Good afternoon. Thank you. Um, what I'm going to say, we've touched on this before. My starting point in this is... What and who is a mayor of London? A mayor of London is a mayor of one of the greatest cities in the world. We've got history. We've got years of history. We've got years of great achievements and so on. And yep. so the mayor of London needs to be what I call a proper, how do we say, balanced kind of Approach. OK, so you, you, don't think, you don't think Sadiq Khan is particularly balanced? And what I'm, and this is what, I, what I'm saying is, and, and I think Lee Anderson, curious enough, in substance was correct. I think his language was badly chosen. I think your predecessor picked up the point. What Lee Anderson should have been saying was, look, this mayor of London needs to take a grip on these problems yeah. and all of that. And the, the real fear in all of this is that the current mayor of London, he's made a lot of mistakes. And I think the real fear of Lee Anderson is that the mayor of London is coming under certain kinds of, let's call them minority influences. Is that something you know or something you suspect, though? Because they are that two is, widely that is different things. That is something... I sort of suspect, I mean, he chose his words in a particular way, which must mean he had some idea that there are some influences around. I'm trying to put it more elegantly to say what we do not need in the mayor's office, doesn't matter where it comes from, but what I call minority interests who really are not in the interests of... OK. Our town. Do you see what I mean? I, I hear you. Simon, thank you very much indeed. And may, maybe they were the words that uh, Lee Anderson should have used, that he felt that, you know, the mayor's, I don't know, you know, diversity agenda, the renaming of all those railway lines, that kind of thing, that, that is pandering to, a mi you know, d minority groups when it doesn't really need to, whether they're about colour, race, religion, gender, sexuality, history, whatever. Uh, that would have been a point. You could have argued whether he was right or wrong, but he could have made that point. Uh, we'll come back to more of your come on in comments on this as well. Was Rishi Sunak right to fire Lee Anderson? Moving on, though. Experts are concerned about a worrying trend for the economy as a recent study found that more people in their early 20s are out of work due to sickness than people in their 40s. Mental health in young people is also on the rise, with those aged 18 to 24 reported to have the poorest of any age group, a complete reversal from two decades ago when they had the lowest. The report stated that as a result of their decline in mental health, young people are more likely to be in lower paid jobs or unemployed. Joining me now, Louise Murphy, senior economist at the Resolution Foundation, the think tank that carried out this research. Uh, good to have you with us, Louise. I mean, there's a, a fair bit to get into here, but we'll try to bridge this as much as we can. Um, so when we talk about young people being ill, are we predominantly talking about young people being ill with mental health issues? So of course, mental health problems aren't the full story. Some young people suffer with physical health problems or illnesses like 
cancer or, or MS. But when we look at the young people who are out of work due to ill health, we think mental health problems are particularly important for two main reasons. One is that mental health problems are the biggest single reason why young people might be out of work due to health problems. So it's bigger than any of those other physical health problems or, or yeah. illnesses. And secondly, we've seen just such a um, dramatic rise in the number of young people reporting poor mental health in a way that we haven't seen big rises in other types of health problems. I mean, there is the the, the other side of that um, assessment, if you like, and I, I'm, I'm certainly not putting this forward as a solid argument, but the suspicion is that, you know, young people are more aware of mental health. How they um, define mental health, the, the bar, but, that they set for what is a mental health, a genuine mental health issue, as distinct from what people many years ago might have just thought was, well, I'm not feeling fantastic, but so what? That's part of the human condition. All of these things, if we sort of recalibrate our expectations. And, and you could say young people today uh, are the first generation to really sort of self-assess or self-analyse in ways that perhaps previous ones wouldn't have done. With all of that in mind, is this a... I wouldn't go as far as saying it's an imagined problem, but are we in danger of exaggerating the problem? So you're absolutely right that the way that we talk about or think about mental health has changed quite significantly in the last couple of decades. And so it's right that these children and young people think about mental health differently to how previous generations did. We can't, we can't deny that, and that probably is part of the, the picture. But what our research showed is that it's certainly not the full picture, that, that what we're seeing is some very real, concrete examples of, of poor mental health having an impact on people's lives. So just to give you a few examples, not only do young people report having these conditions themselves, they also report that they're having big consequences on their day-to-day -day life. For example, people losing sleep or not enjoying day-to-day -day activities um, mm. due to their, their well-being. But similarly, we're seeing, for example, an increasing number of young people be prescribed antidepressant drugs from, from doctors. That number is now over um, 500,000 young people in England are prescribed these drugs. And we've also seen an increase in the number of young people being awarded disability benefits for, for mental health problems, where the burden of evidence that you have to provide to be able to be awarded these benefits is is really quite strong no, and that get, hasn't yeah. weakened over time. I, I, I totally get that. You you can't just pitch up and say, you know, g g give me the wonga, please. I've got a head problem. <laughs> that does, doesn't work like that. Um, so, so there is real tangible evidence, if you like, of a, of, a, of a problem. Do we know why? Just a final point, Louise. Is this, you know, we're living in tough times. Again, we can analyse the world we live in in a greater way than we ever could before. Um, we think about, you know, things around our future we think about young people think about will i ever get on the housing ladder you know how long would it take me to get the ideal job the kind of job that is seen as ideal the 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 yardsticks might have moved on that as well is it a combination of all of that i, th I think you're probably right that there's lots of things going on at once as you say um you know we've lived through the the, the covid pandemic we're now in a cost of living crisis and we've seen a big rise in the use of, of social media all of these things will impact young people's day-to-day -day lives but i think the important thing really to bear in mind is to think about you know which young people are really at the sharp end of this crisis and what our research has shown is that it's young people who are not graduates, so those young people who have low, lower levels of qualifications, who are what we might think of as being doubly disadvantaged when it comes to the world of work. Not only do they have poor health, but they also have um, low levels of qualifications, making it harder to, to find and, and yeah. stay in work. Okay, Louise, thank you for your time. Louise Murphy, Senior Economist at the Resolution Foundation behind that research. We'll take some comment on that as well. 0344 499 1000. Coming up after the break, Jeremy Hunt is deciding what to do with his 16 billion quid surplus as Tory MPs lobby for tax cuts. We'll look at that, plus more comment from you. I'm Ian Collins. You're with Talk on TV, radio, online, and your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Oh, it's, bless him, he's soaking wet. Yes. The most likely situation is that 
That statue is going to end up in M Shed, which is a museum just on the harbour. Nick, I, when we first went to you, I thought you dived into the harbour to get the, get the thing out, for God's sake, man. Well done. Good job. Islamism is sweeping our nation. This is not Islamophobia. This is real. Another terror attack, another killing of an MP. Oh, don't worry, let's light a candle, let's all sing, let's look, don't look back in anger and sing Kumbaya. He had a, a politically uh, minded project called WikiLeaks, which said nothing about what was going on in the Kremlin, nothing about what was going on in China. There was a clear political bias in what he was doing. This is the first time Millam has heard of asylum seekers coming to the town. If we are guinea pigs, then I think we should have been consulted. This concept that actually kids wouldn't carry knives if they could go and play tiddlywinks at the, you know, the corner of a street or whatever. I think it's a nonsense. Well, it will be a problem if they start breaking into people's homes because they can break into yours and decide that you're not doing enough. <laughs> and they can break into mine and decide I'm not doing enough. And I'll tell you what, if they break into my home, it will get violent. That's for sure. It's not like, you know, they live in an average semi and where's Harry going to sleep? You might have thought he's come all the way. Couldn't he at least have spent a couple of days with them at Sandringham just, you know, to use the vernacular, chilling out a bit? <laughs> What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! It's carry on. <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> Whoa, it. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. I know what's I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> There are no banners calling for the release of the condemn, hostages. They will not there condemn are no Hamas. banners, Kevin. You can't say everyone on that march not, when no, we can't say no, Hamas. Sorry, no, I, yeah. sorry, I've got, I've got you both. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, no, good. I'm, no, so, no, I'm sorry. Stop creating all of these funny little factions with their funny little names, the New Conservatives, the ERG, the Common Sense Research Group, the Red Wall, Red Trouser, Popcorn. I mean, Popcorn, what, what is that? What on earth? is going on in the House of Commons. I'll try my very best to explain that, Daisy, but it is an extremely complicated situation. This just absolutely stinks. Right, Neil Parrish, he was great for his area. If Richard Soon actually brought him out today and said, this guy's going to be advised by a special right. counsel. If anybody can pull it off, it'll be him. Oh. <laughs> what? Oh. What? <laughs> my your mind. mind. <laughs> it's not our minds, it's your mouth, Mr. Unbelievable. Collins. Unbelievable. Yeah. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. And welcome back to the show. I'm Ian Collins. We talk on TV, radio, online and your smart speaker. Now, Jeremy Hunt under pressure from his fellow Tories to cut taxes in next month's budget with a £16 billion surplus worth of headroom to play with. The Chancellor is still making up his mind on how to splash that cash. Today, 107 One Nation Conservative MPs urged the Treasury to prioritise cutting taxes for working people. Joining me now to discuss this political talk to his political correspondent, Lindsay Fitzgerald, is with us. I've never got the tax cut thing, not really, unless you're going to cut it by 50% for income tax. Mm -hmm. um, generally speaking, if you've got 16 billion quid, sounds like a lot of money. There are specific reasons why he's got that money from January. But um, if he were to divvy that out to everybody with a bit of a tax cut, I mean... Is it going to be 1p or something well, saving exactly. here and there? It's not going to be something that you'd go, wow, I've never been so well off. Well, I should hope not. <laughs> Let's put it that way. I mean, yeah, this is the thing. Politicians like to use the term tax cuts as if it's going to be the be-all and end-all yeah, yeah. between someone really, really struggling and someone suddenly having loads and loads of cash in their pocket. And as you're saying, the figures that we're talking are really quite minimal. Yes. But I think it's more about messaging at the moment. The Conservative Party always were seen as the party for lower taxes. Yep. And that has been the opposite of what we've seen in the past few years. We've got the highest tax burden in 70-something years, Correct. which is pretty much a record. So I think basically before the election what the Conservatives will be really really trying to do is to be able to claim that they have cut taxes at some point obviously Liz Truss tried mm. to do that when she was Prime Minister for that that short period didn't quite go to plan for her and since then Jeremy Hunt has just said that there hasn't really been the fiscal room so I think this is the last chance before the election that the Conservatives have to actually do anything about this. Could they not just go all out even if they don't mean it could they not just say right what we're going to do we're going to whip off a load of tax on fuel duty we're going to get free childcare for everyone under the age of five or something like that. It's stuff that is very tangible. 
that you could go, wow, that makes a difference. When they t the generic term tax cuts doesn't tell us very much, does it? I mean, where, where, where are these taxes? Is it on VAT? Is it on national insurance? Is it on income tax? Mm. There's many other places. Well, it's interesting because, well, the first part of that is the issue with just making these really big gambles and the big promises yeah. are they, that they can't cost them properly. So although we have quite a big sum of money um, to play with, yeah. technically, in terms of what we've had in the past couple of years or so, if Jeremy Hunt comes forward and starts making these really big promises, we'll have what happened with Liz Truss when she made some promises and not all of them were costed properly, which mm. then spooked the markets. You saw the drop in the value of the pound, various other consequences like that. So that's what they need to make sure that they don't do. Yeah. And I'm sure why Jeremy Hunt will probably be, try and be a bit more careful. The second part of this is, is what the One Nation Conservatives that, that you mentioned a second ago, what they're urging is that there's a cut to income tax. And that is the thing that the Conservatives have been trying to do for so long and just have felt that we can't yeah. afford at the moment because that's really what squeezes people when they're paying tax from, the, from, from their pockets, True. basically. But of course you can... You know, one of the great tricks is to cut the rate of income tax, but then just move a load of people into the next bracket. Mm -hmm. So, yes, you've cut it for some people. I mean, they have cut it. I mean, the Conservatives, I don't think they get enough credit for this. From 2010, arguably along with the Lib Dems, you know, mm -hmm. for the people who earn the very lowest, they've increasingly uh, been able to make sure that group pay no tax at all. Mm -hmm. So when all the money was... Uh, all the, all the, 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 the conversation was on, you know, they... Uh, reduced tax to 45p after Gordon Brown hiked it up five minutes before he left office. Uh, and actually, I think the biggest income tax story was the removal of all tax, income tax, for the, the those on the very lowest. Definitely, and that will have been hugely beneficial and impactful to so many people, Correct. and that needs to be definitely flagged, yeah. and they need to have praise for that because that's a huge deal. But also, as you mentioned a second ago, we have the issue of, and my favourite term ever, fiscal drag. Isn't that great? Fiscal drag, they love that. <laughs> the driest, most boring yeah, sounding thing ever. But the trouble is, is basically they chose to freeze tax income tax thresholds yep. until 2028, meaning that whilst they've kind of boosted... Uh, minimum wage, for example, which is also a positive thing. Of no quibs about that. Most people's taxes, uh, most people's wages, sorry, have increased with inflation. Yep. Not most, a lot of people's a have, lot, yeah. which pushes them up into sometimes higher tax bands, yep. and then they're therefore pay paying more tax. So there's a few things at play Indeed. here. Indeed. Uh, brief word um, on Lee Anderson, the Tories' mm. Islamophobia problem. He still hasn't said sorry. He hasn't. And it's interesting because we're hearing so many rumours on all sides of this. We're hearing, oh, he might join reform. Oh, no, he's really desperate to get, get back into the Conservative Party. And I think it's really actually hard to say what is going to yeah. happen with him because... On the one hand, you'd think if he wanted to get back into the Conservative Party, he maybe would have kowtowed to Rishi Sunak and actually come forward and said, actually, I am really sorry, yeah, yeah. accept me, take me back. But he hasn't done that. He's doubled down. That's true. And he said, no, I stand by what I said, pretty much. Although he did say that what, his words were clumsy, he hasn't for one minute said that yeah. he, you know takes back what he said initially. And he's not going to, is he? And he's probably not going to. I mean, it'd be very unlikely Anderson to ever do that. I mean, he's a man who, when, when he has an opinion, we know his opinion, yeah, and yeah. he always stands by it. So I think it's unlikely that we will suddenly hear him come with his tail between his legs and apologise for that. We will see. Alicia, thank you. Alicia Fitzgerald, Talk TV's political correspondent with us on the programme. We've been asking that question, was Rishi right to suspend Lee Anderson? Uh, let's go to your calls. Jean is over there in Norfolk. How are you doing, Jean? I apologise. Um, I'm, I wanted to speak to you about um, Lee Anderson. Yeah. And I think he's a, a good man and I think he's being honest and I don't see why he should have to apologise for being honest. Um, but was he being... I mean, you say he was being honest, but he, you know, he talked about uh, Sadiq Khan, essentially London's being run by uh, a group of Islamists. Yeah. Well, there's there's no to... evidence for that, Jean. That's the problem well, that Lee's speak... got. Well, I've lived here in Norfolk for 18 years, but prior to that, I'm 80, I'm 80 years of age, but I'm a, an East Ender, born and bred. My roots are there, and I love my East End. Okay. Now, I, I feel no one is speaking about the few white elderly indigenous East Enders that are left there and the way they're being treated by the Muslims, and it is appalling. They were not, I've tried for a year now to get through to you and speak to you on this station, and... Um, 
I am like this is the first time I've got through. When, no when you say speaking... sorry to interject, Jean, and I know we haven't got long, so this is, probably deserves a longer conversation. It does. But when you say, I mean, I lived in the East End as well. I lived in Bow, and it was a very. You're right. It's a very mixed area. Nelly, the 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 old lady that used to live uh, just above me, she'd lived there all her life, and uh, you know she'd seen it change very much. But I don't know whether she was having any bad treatment from Muslims. It was just a very oh, yeah, changing I, area. I can tell you firsthand. I come from Canning Town. Just down the road, yeah. Before I left there, so and it's even worse now, but I, that was 18 years ago I left there, I've been threatened, I've been spat at by Muslims. It's been diabolical for just walk, walking along one just day. With for, a OK, and if that's... Listen, I'm not going to in any way question your own experience, Gene, and that is outrageous. That is an act of racism. You, there, there's no one could justify why you should go through that just by dint of the fact that you're a, a white woman walking through a, an area that is um, multicultural or dominated by another group of people. Listen, Jean, I move on for time, no other reason. Rachel is in Hertfordshire. Rachel, how are you? I'm well, thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I just don't understand what's happened to the Conservative Party. They seem totally terrified of anyone speaking their mind. Suella, firstly, and now Lee. No, he shouldn't apologise. Absolutely not. Even if he was wrong, he, should he not apologise? He doesn't think he's wrong, and I don't think he's wrong. But he's, uh, uh, the idea that it's, it's Sadiq Khan's got his Islamist mates running the place did he, did it isn't he true. Say, did he actually use the word Islamists? Islamist was the, the phrase he used. I didn't think he did. But, but even so, I think, yes, he has foresight. I mean, you have to look years ahead. And the Conservative Party, now I've been a Conservative Party, I'm in my 80s, all my life, um, they don't seem to want to know, but to look ahead. Do you think, though, that the, the Tories lose something here? Because last week they, they kind of had the moral high ground over Labour with all the anti-Semitism going on, and then this happens, and it leaves them open to the accusation, well, you lot have got the same problem as we've got, so you can't be lecturing us on anything. Well, I, I don't know about that, but I, I just think um, he was speaking the truth, his, what they now say, his truth... Um, yeah, and why I th don't they like it? Why don't why can't they right. accept it? Okay, that that's the the, as you say, it. as Oprah Winfrey would say, that is his truth. Thank you very much indeed for that call. Uh, this in from Peter: Just treat all people how you wish to be treated, no matter what religion they are. Uh, that's a fair point. And Richard says uh, there's only one spine in Parliament, and Lee Anderson is the owner of said spine. That is the end of the show. Thank you for tuning in. Join us again, same time tomorrow, 3 o'clock. Up next, though, it's Vanessa Feltz. I'm back tonight at 6 on The Talk. Have a great afternoon. Goodbye. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And you're on your smart speaking. Oh, it's, bless him, he's soaking wet. Nice. The most likely situation is that that statue is going to end up in M Shed, which is a museum just on the harbour. Nick, I, when we first went to you, I thought you dived into the harbour to get the, get the thing out, for God's sake, man. Well done, good job. Islamism is sweeping our nation. This is not Islamophobia, this is real. Another terror attack, another killing of an MP. Oh, don't worry, let's light a candle, let's all sing, let's look, don't look back in anger and sing Kumbaya. He had a, a politically uh, minded project called WikiLeaks, but it said yeah. nothing about what was going on in the Kremlin, nothing about what was going on in China. There was a clear political bias in what he was doing. This is the first time Millam has heard of asylum seekers coming to the town. If we are guinea pigs, then I think we should have been consulted. This concept that actually kids wouldn't carry knives if they could go and play tiddlywinks at the, you know, the corner of a street or whatever. I think it's a nonsense. Well, it will be a problem if they start breaking into people's homes because they can break into yours and decide that you're not doing enough. <laughs> they can break into mine and decide I'm not doing enough. And I tell you what, if they break into my home, it will get violent. That's for sure. It's not like, you know, they live in an average semi and where's Harry going to sleep? You might have thought he's come all the way. Couldn't he at least have spent a couple of days with them at Sandringham just, you know, to use the vernacular, chilling out a bit? <laughs>